All right. So I think today we're going to spend some time sort of just going over a general discussion and overview of workhorse. Um, no real sort of plan in particular, but touching on any sort of general design points of interest conventions that may exist, and then maybe getting a little bit into the package related aspects uh, as we work towards the uh, general idea of moving the dependency proxy to workhorse. So uh, maybe I'll hand it over to Nick. I realized that this is going to happen at approximately three o'clock today when I've looked at the agenda and was like, oh, I see I've got to present on workhorse and talk all about workhorse. Which in my head wasn't what was going to happen today. We were just going to get a chat about this feature in particular. So I'll apologize in advance if any of this is quite unstructured. I had a, a last minute brush around for references and I've popped those into the chat there. Uh, I guess I'll share my screen just so that we're all on the same sort of page. Um, yeah, I guess I'll just talk and try to address these main points. And if you have any questions or anything you're particularly interested in as I go along, or just want to interrupt and send me on a different path altogether, just let me know. Uh, I don't want to be talking if what I'm talking about is uninteresting. I want to be talking about things that are interesting to you. Uh, so in terms of a general design and structure of workhorse, I guess we start with the overall architecture of GitLab. And workhorse is a HTTP reverse proxy, sits in front of GitLab actual down here, Puma GitLab Rails, and it intercepts every single HTTP request that goes to GitLab Rails. So everything you write in a controller, all that code is handling HTTP requests and returning HTTP responses that have come through GitLab Workhorse. GitLab Workhorse always has a reverse proxy in front of it. Usually that's Nginx. Uh, sometimes people install from source, they put uh, Apache in front instead. That's not something we support very well, but it does work. Um, quite often people will then have another reverse proxy in front of Nginx or Apache, like HA proxy. GitLab.com then has another layer in front of that, which is uh, Cloudflare or whatever our um, CDN is at the moment. I've honestly stopped trying to keep track of that. So there's a long list of HTTP reverse proxies. Nginx is unlike most of the others, sorry, GitLab Workhorse is unlike most of the others in that it's very tightly coupled to GitLab Rails. The rest are quite generic servers. Workhorse is full of code that makes changes that GitLab Rails depends on um, in order to do its job, um, offload work to Workhorse when that's required, etc. So the two components are very tightly coupled, which is not normal for a reverse proxy. Normally a reverse proxy will be quite generic and it won't have very closely coupled per root behavior in the way that Workhorse does. Does that make sense? There's any lots of nodding and thumbs ups, that's great. Uh, I guess the major, well, we'll keep on this for a little while. The most important thing about Workhorse is what it's doing with the requests and the responses. And I looked up this code a little while ago. So this is internal upstream roots.go, which is essentially where all the magic happens in Workhorse. And most of you on this call will have seen this bit of code already, uh, u.root, et cetera. These are all instructions to Workhorse to say, for this particular route, do this special magic. Um, and this is one of the two ways in which Workhorse operates. Each of these routes has special code attached to it, which is here, which says, do something to the request before sending it off to GitLab Rails. And we rely on this for uploading to a very great extent. Um, so here we're pushing the body of the request up to object storage usually, um, and then replacing the reference in the HTTP request that goes on to GitLab Rails with the location of the file. Um, so GitLab Rails itself doesn't have to bother with the file at all. It only has to bother with the reference to the file. And that's how they're very closely coupled. As uh, David Fernandez pointed out in the issue, which I read his comment about five minutes before this meeting started, there is another way in which Workhorse behaves. Um, as I say, we've got all these different routes which have special logic encoded, and this executes code before the request is sent off to uh, GitLab Rails. It can also execute code after the request has been sent off to GitLab Rails. Um, it can do basically anything it wants to. But we also have a more general idea, which is line 19... 
six just here it changed uh, in the past few minutes. We have this idea of a general proxy, which is full of all this magic. And these are actually response filters rather than request filters. So we have a thing called send data, we have a thing called send file, send archive, send wolf, send diff. And what all these do is the request gets passed on to GitLab Rails unmodified uh, via this standard proxy that we have here. It just takes the request, hands it off to GitLab Rails. When GitLab Rails's response comes back, if it has a magic header, then Workhorse will perform actions that are dictated by that header. So you can ask it to send a file. This is the GitLab Workhorse send data header that uh, David was talking about. There's a similar header for send an archive from the Git repository, send a blob from the Git repository or a diff. And originally all of these would call out to Git commands. They would run Git show object. Uh, now they do Gitly RPC calls instead and send the response back to the eventual client. They're all replacing the response body. Um, and they're quite a lot more restricted in what they can do compared to these ones down here because these can operate both before and after the request has been sent. Uh, they can do things while the request has been sent, but before the response has been received. They can do things after the response has been received. Uh, they can do call and response type patterns. These are limited to modifying the response that comes back from the uh, GitLab Rails upstream. They can do other things as well, but in general, they can't modify the request. They can only modify the response that the client sees. Uh, and I know there was some discussion about whether we're going to use this approach or this approach when it comes to building the dependency proxy in Workhorse. From my perspective, either can work. You can probably make it work with either. I don't know if perhaps this approach is a little more appropriate, but it's not a strong feeling on my part. I, I could quite happily see an implementation that does either. Uh, yeah, so that's the general idea of how Workhorse functions and the kinds of thing it, things it does. Does that make sense to everyone? Are there any questions? I'm kind of curious um, with the idea of like Rails handing back headers. Um, is there uh, like a specific reason why why it's better to use headers in the response versus you know just handing back a response body for Workhorse to deal with? Uh, I think that the answer to that, you can see I'm stalling for time, is how the response writer works inside of Go. It's very hard to interpret the start of the response body. It's really easy to interpret the response headers. Um, and in general, you load all of the response headers up and you leave the body unread entirely until you've decided what to do with it based on the headers. So if I take the internal send data, I'm completely off piece now. It might be in here. Infect, uh, in fact, that's not it. Maybe it's send data. Go. So this is the implementation of the send data response parser. And this is what reads the response headers in Workhorse. Uh, there we go. So here's where all the magic is happening. At the point where we run this, we've already read all the headers from GitLab Rails, but we have read none of the response body. Uh, the response body can be an arbitrary size. Um, and it's difficult to know how much of it to read. So I think it ended up in the header simply because it's more convenient that way. It doesn't have to be there, but it's just what we happen to have implemented. Oh, that makes sense. Thanks. Yeah, adding a new um, send data injector is what we call it. I guess it's, there's a little more explanation. So this is strictly related to that line 197 I showed off and this. So you see, we have these different implementers and David was talking about, and then we probably have a uh, proxy like so. This is 
really simple to add as a new, it's called an injector, one of these. This is, declares the interface for the injector. You, all the code that you would write for the new dependency proxy would be called like the inside this package and you just create a new instance that can carry the state it needs around. Send data will take the metadata that GitLab Rails has written, pass it, match it with that injector, which is the new code you'd be writing, and then it would invoke it for you with the decoded data. So this approach is quite simple. It's a bit more involved than this kind of approach where you're saying just run this function whenever you see this route. Uh, but the, the infrastructure is there. And I guess what I'm trying to show is that it's not difficult to add new things here. It's not a large overhead. Uh, we recently added this new image resizer. So when GitLab sends back a large image, uh, we dynamically, GitLab doesn't normally send back images. It will send a reference to the image. Um, and now we take that image and we can make it smaller in the client so that it's more convenient to read. This was only added a few months ago, so it's not difficult to do in the abstract. Uh, all the difficulty is inside this new hypothetical function here. Um, now it was. Let's pop back to the agenda. Uh, yeah, so that's the general design and structure of Workforce. As I say, it just sits in front of GitLab Rails interprets some requests, interprets some responses. Everything goes through Workhorse, but it only chooses to interpret certain requests, especially depending on whether the request headers, including the path, match what it wants to do, or the response headers tell Workhorse to do something, which is what the set data structure is. Uh, are there any major points of interest in particular you want to go through, or is that kind of linked into the general designer structure? Yeah, it's probably linked. It was just, I, I actually threw this together just 20 minutes before the meeting, probably. So it was, it's a very casual. Uh, as long as there's none of us is super prepared, yeah. then none of us no. looks bad. So it's, yeah. it's absolutely fine. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I think back in 2019, when we first implemented the dependency proxy, uh, there was some question then over whether or not it should be in workhorse. And I think it got merged more or less because we only turned it on if Puma was enabled. And at the time, Puma wasn't enabled on gitlab.com. And maybe a year later, we enabled Puma on gitlab.com. And I don't know if we just forgot about the dependency proxy and it became enabled almost by accident on gitlab.com. But ever since that happened, it's been running and it's only kind of caused us to circle back around and say, okay, now it's time to implement it in Workhorse fairly recently. So we've gotten a good year or two out of the Rails implementation, which is quite impressive. I did link to the original uh, implementation merge request here because I thought it was quite useful to refresh my memory on how the whole dependency proxy hangs together at the moment. And I'm, I'm assuming the code hasn't changed a great deal since it was written, but let's just... The general idea of how it handles It has the same images. roots, I guess that's yeah. the most important. Yeah. So we have these two the are particularly important. And to me, making both of these be in workhorse, this one, the manifest is just as important as the blob because yes, this is a small file, but if the upstream server is misbehaving, this can cause just as many problems as the large blob. It doesn't matter if it's a, a hundred byte file, if it's taking an hour to be proxied from server down to client. So in terms of how we approach it in Workhorse, we are either intercepting these two routes so that we rewrite the request and do other things instead of executing the existing Rails code, or in Rails, we are, if we go to the controller, we are modifying this. So that instead of sending a regular ordinary one of these, Yeah, so at the moment we are actually using the send upload, which is a workhorse magic. That's using the send data header that we talked about. If we happen to have the blob already, and then if not, we're just returning back the status that we don't have it, uh, proxying back the error. So we can either enhance this so that this code is happening in workhorse beforehand, or we can change this send upload to be fetch and send upload or something similar to that, which was David's um, suggestion just recently. 
And as I say, I don't have a strong preference on either of those. Convention-wise, the good news about GitLab Workhorse is that it's very standard Go, and Go has a very opinionated set of rules about how to write code in Go. There are some GitLab-specific things, but they're almost all encoded in the make file, uh, which is in here. We've got a very large make file. We have make format, which will do FMT which does a large number of custom checks. And there are some special rules about what you can do inside of Workhorse. We have a rule about using context, for instance. You can't use context.background somewhere because if you do, the make file will complain that it's incorrect. We like everything to be descended from a single context so that you can cancel the entire process uh, quite easily from a single head point. Another rule is to do with logging. Um, we like the log messages to be structured. Uh, they're usually outputted using JSON and fields. So uh, let's just see if I can give you an example in code. Uh, so we've got all these different error messages that we're giving and we'll only ever use print or warn or similar words here. We will never use format strings inside of the error message. The error is always static and then any fields or any context get added on in here. And what that does, if I can find the recourse log, you can see you always have, this might be the access log but the message is always static. So it's easy to search in um, Kibana. And then you have all of the interesting data, the things that might vary between different instances, of the same log message passed out as separate fields. It's just important for observability. But again, if you get that wrong, the make file will complain at you in, in CI and it will tell you, you can't do this. So it's fairly well behaved in that respect. Other than that, it's a pretty standard Go project. Go is very well suited to this class of problem, HTTP servers. So it's, it's served as well. I guess I don't have a great deal more to say about Workhorse that's generally applicable. Uh, so I don't know if you wanted to talk about the nitty gritty of the dependency proxy or if you had questions about what I've just said or anything like that. Yeah, so I think with the dependency proxy, um... So there's there's kind of we've been kind of actually thinking about you said maybe we could use the um, response headers or maybe we could use the uh, request interception and I think we've kind of discussed the idea of using both <laughs> um, where we would probably um, hijack the response or the request in order to say hey Rails do we have access authorize us please you know figure out what images need to be pulled or whether or not we're pulling it from cache. And then Rails would then return possibly the response header if a new image needs to be pulled or if we're just using the send and the upload if it's already cached. Um, and then if a new image needs to be pulled, I think the, com the, the new part that we'd be adding to Workhorse is where Workhorse actually pulls the image from Docker Hub or from wherever we end up maybe connecting to in the future. Um, so it, it sounds like we might be able to use both of those strategies and then build out a new, I think you called it a new injector to be able to manage the pulls from Docker Hub. So I guess we only have a single get endpoint. So I mean, is the idea that if the image isn't present yet, you would redirect to a different URL to handle it or? So if, if the image isn't present yet, then um, right now Rails makes a request for an access token from Docker Hub and then makes a request for the actual um, you know, blob or manifest. Hmm. And so I think the initial idea, and we, you know, it's still just ideas, was to still allow Rails to either request that token 
or um, provide credentials to um, Workhorse if needed, and then allow Workhorse to make the request. Hmm. I guess one of the problems that comes to mind with that is the idea of sending this pre-signed download URL all the way back to the client. Uh, artifacts and object storage in GitLab have a setting called, I forget what the setting is called just now, but the idea is sometimes the object store is not directly accessible to the client. It might be, for instance, a NetApp um, appliance which is sat on private IP space. And when that happens, proxy download is called. Uh, so if we go to gitlab.yml just here and we find the artifacts config. Uh, we can have in here proxy download false. When the proxy download is false, you're always sending the object store uh, uh. URL directly back to the client as a, as a redirect or so on. But when proxy download is true, the object store is not visible to the client at all. And what happens is that GitLab workhorse, well, as it says, it proxies the URL so that it's hiding the implementation details of the object store from the eventual client. So I, I guess I'm wondering how that approach where you're sending back the pre-signed download the URL, as you say, how is that going to work if we have proxy download turned on? Yeah, I think I think this would be two options, one without, as you said, one without proxying, one with proxying. And actually the way this is laid out is similar to how the container registry works. That is also a similar option as well. And for GitLab.com, that, that is always redirect clients uh, mm -hmm. and self-managed get to choose if they want that or not. So I, I think we will uh, we would have to provide an equivalent option for for this as well, so that it, it is consistent um, with the rest of the artifacts um, download as well. Um, so this would be one version, which is when um, redirect is enabled. Uh, if not, then we would have to proxy the, the download. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, I've said to you then that with the URL here that would be gitlab.com slash something. Uh, and we'd need to keep that state somewhere. When proxy download is turned off, then it's completely stateless. Everything you need is encoded in the URL. And that's going out to an external service, which has the state. When proxy download is true, you need to generate and save some state somewhere to make this part work. And that's the bit that I suppose worries me a little bit about this approach. I'm, I'm sure it's solvable. I'm just uh, thinking about it. Isn't guess, it something approach. that we already have uh, with package download? I'm not too sure about that. Is there a case in package downloads where you have this double request approach? Um, no, but uh, you when you download the package you still access an object in object storage and you can still configure if you want the proxy enable or not and the endpoint will still work in both cases yeah in that case everything is inside the single request uh, so the state that's required there is all internal I, I guess what i've got here is new states that we're asking the client to hold on to for us between the two requests which is a difficult part Essentially, when proxy download is turned on, what do we put in the URL that allows this request to be correlated with this request? If that makes sense. You mean when, when Workhorse actually pulls from like Docker Hub? Oh. I'm just thinking it through. Uh, so here we have work that goes on. Why do we pull from Docker Hub in here? So the container registry is is the would be like the example that would be Docker Hub on this diagram. So just down here. Uh, I guess.
guess what I'm missing from here are the, so we go back to the client here. Assume this thing is a bit small, but when does the client come back to us? Like there's no, there's two left arrows here. But oh, here we are, right yeah, but, here. But it's uh, quite a bit later. I it's see a, it. it's an it's an option. It's in case of a, ca a cash hit and in case of a cash miss. Hmm. Okay. And so we will always send a single response to the client, which could be a redirect or not, depending on the proxy setting, I guess. But from the client point of view, it will be always a request and a response. And I think from the client point of view, I mean, well, not necessarily from the point of view, but um, I think things will generally always be served from, like from object storage, maybe. <laughs> um, if, if there's a cache hit, then we kind of treat it like we do with package downloads. We're just downloading something from object storage. If it's a not if it's not a cache hit, then workhorse downloads it from um, externally first, and then either serves that response and also caches it, or maybe we cache it first and then serve it directly from object storage, I which would take extra time. But thing here, but yeah. So we have request one here and then request two here, and that makes a lot more sense. Uh, there's work going on here. That's an alt. So this is what happens in the middle. So we don't send back the 307 temporary redirect until we've completed downloading the thing from Docker Hub or the container registry. Yeah, downloading from the registry, saving that to object storage, and then we would uh, redirect the client to object storage because the, the blob is already there. Yeah, that makes uh, sense then. That's where the state is, and that's the question that I had. Yeah, uh, yeah. The state is stored by creating that file in object storage. Um, so yeah, this, this can potentially work perfectly well. And it would just be a matter of writing it. And that's the bit where we all got stuck. Do um, we have, oh, go ahead. Yeah, a, a small note on the idea that on the comment I, I put on the issue, so on this interaction uh, schema, we see that there is an authorize right uh, after the first get. So we are using a route, if I'm getting this correctly, meaning that workhorse will, will intercept that get and do something. Yeah, yeah. And my idea was to not do this, but instead use only the response uh, injectors to tell workhorse, hey, you, we have a, we have a file at this URL. Uh, you need those credentials, and you need to download the file, request an upload to this URL. So that would be a, like an internal URL um, baked by um, Rails. But uh, download, uh, yeah. So download from this URL with these credentials. Take the take the data what that you found there, upload it to Rails, and then send it back to the client. Uh, that's a, <laughs> a lot of of uh, logic in a single response, <laughs> but the nice thing is that once workhorse has this response, it can fetch the data from the URL, hmm. and then just follow the same logic for file uploads meaning I have a, a file here and I need to upload this to this URL on Rails. So I will contact uh, Rails on the authorized point to get the object storage uh, key or location and upload it there. And then once that happens, which is the upload logic, we can send it back to the, to the client. Yeah, and I was, I was actually quite amused when I saw this pop up because it, essentially recapitulates the discussion me and Jakob had two years ago. Uh, where's that gone to? Sorry, I have to keep going back here because the Zoom keeps hiding. So essentially, back in April 2019, I was like, ooh, we should use the authorizer approach with the roots in order to, to make this happen in workhorse. And then uh, Jakob right at the end suggested, oh no, let's just use GitLab workhorse send data, which is David's suggestion. So as I said, I think either can work. I don't have a strong opinion as to which approach to use. I think that's probably best left to whoever does end up implementing it. 
which probably won't be me because I am disappearing on the 16th of October for paternity leave. So chances are somebody else will implement it and I will be consulting on it while I'm there, but it, it wouldn't be very good for me to write this and then disappear and just kind of throw it in everybody's laps. Uh, we need to build up knowledge in other people in source code for workhorse. So yeah, whoever does end up coming to this will have the one or approach or the other. And I think that decision is best left to them. Either can work, there are pros and cons to both approaches, but I wouldn't want to sit someone down and say, you're implementing this and you have to follow this plan that I've devised. I would much rather have them work through it and make the decision for themselves. Now that we are talking about both approaches, I see a small slight benefit on the uh, response header approach, which is uh, this, this need of telling workhorse, hey, download this and cache it on object storage using this URL on Rails. This will be reused on some features from the package team, such as the dependency proxy for packages or virtual registries, which are basically a package registry, a package registry endpoint that will um, that will gather many URLs that could be internal or external that have packages, and we could be implementing caching there. So using the response header means that adding a new route to use this, we don't do, we don't need any change on workhorse. We just send the response and implement the authorize and the upload endpoint, and that's it. Using the um, new, well, the, the, the route uh, approach, we would need to uh, implement a new route on workhorse to catch the the request if i'm not wrong yeah and we've observed this with package bus loaders in particular if we go back to root stock go we can see every time we add a new type of package we have to add a new route and it gets long and it's quite awful and if these were instead implemented as send data type filters if there was some way of doing that and i don't think there is um for those package uploaders then you wouldn't have to do that you would just be able to send the response header because these filter every single response every single response is checked against these whereas here you have to link it to a specific path so this is best for very specific functionality that's only relevant to a single route whereas this is best for something that any rails controller could conceivably do um, yeah Were there any more questions or ideas? I, I don't, as I said, I don't really want to come out of this with a firm recommendation and say we should do it this way. Um, none of us sat here at the beginning of this issue actually know what the challenges are going to be once we get halfway down. So yeah, I would much rather leave the person implementing it with the capability to change their minds halfway through and say, actually, I've tried the root approach and it's too difficult. I've tried the, the send data approach and that's better. So I'm going to do some data or vice versa. Uh, a lot depends on things we just don't know at the moment. Cool. Yeah, I think um, that was a great little overview and intro. Um, so thank you for coming to help us out. And then I'm sure it's probably going to be one of us eventually that will start digging in and working on this. So I'm sure we'll be pinging you or some of the other work for, workhorse folks um, for some help along the way. I think Sean mentioned that he thinks, and Sean Carroll, um, source code backend engineering manager mentioned that he thinks source code should be the ones to implement it. Uh, I don't have a strong opinion either way. I think source code does need to have more workhorse expertise and this could be an ideal opportunity to build that expertise in source code by having someone in source code implement it. Uh, for a bit of context, we only really have I think it's three maintainers, maybe four maintainers now of workhorse, and only one of them, myself, is in source code. So, well, quite often when there are things that need to be done in workhorse, it's somebody outside of source code who ends up doing it, just because we don't have the capacity. And this would be an ideal approach to build capacity in source code. If there are scheduling concerns, I don't have the, the final say on it, but I would very much like source code to 
be building a significant part of this. That's it. Okay, cool. I have one extra question on workhorse. Sure, sure. Uh, it's for the, the upload, so uh, nothing linked to the dependency proxy. Uh, you said that for the response that workhorse gets from Rails, the headers are available um, quickly be before the body, meaning yes. that you don't need to, to read the body, you get the headers. Those that happen uh, in the same way for request, upload requests? Uh, yes. Uh, if I show you the, I'll just share my screen again very briefly, so I know we're running over time. Are we running um, over time? Or was this a longer meeting than I remember? I scheduled it long, time. but- What am I on about? Yeah. It's, it's absolutely fine. I don't mind going over. I was just thinking of everybody else. Uh, so if we go back to the- so this is upstream not go, which does the hard work of sending the requests to Rails and returning it. I'm just looking for we have this um interface, which is common across all of GoV serve HTTP interface. And by the time we hit our code, we've already read the HTTP request. This contains all the request headers already. The body is not yet read. The body is an IO object that you can read if you choose to. But at the time when we're executing all of this code, this happens before we decide what to do. Uh, so for instance, we immediately forbid any connect requests because those are evil uh, and so on. This happens really, really, really early. We already okay. have the request headers. We don't yet have the request body. Chances are the request body is still in the client. The eventual HTTP client hasn't sent a single request of the body yet, but we're executing code that can work with the headers and can even start replying if it wants to. Okay. Um, so I'm asking because I hit a uh, slight bug. <laughs> so we have uh, packages for Nugget where the, the client Nugget will do something uh, not strange, but I guess expected. He will trigger an upload request without any credentials first. And if it receives a, uh, I don't recall the, the status code, something oh, like, yes. hey, you need to authenticate, it will redo the upload request with the proper credentials. And what happens on staging and production, if you have a, quite big file, like a, like a one gigabyte NuGet package, the first request seems to be uploaded entirely because it's really, really long. Like it's a eight minutes, eight minutes upload. And I was expecting the headers to be read quickly so that the authorized endpoint is, um, called and then Rails will reply, no, this, this first request is not a valid one because we need credentials and we can reply back uh, quickly. So uploading that big Nugget package ends up in waiting for like 15, 20 minutes because you have two full upload requests done. And I was wondering if that, if that first uh, upload request could be shortened somehow. Yeah, I think we have come across this before in, this is why I was searching for the issue while you were talking. Kerberos Auth does a very similar thing. And we get back the, uh, where are we? 401 response very quickly. And then we have this 100 continue from the client as well. So I think it's a similar problem to this. And I, I don't have an immediate answer, but I don't even know if we solved this. I think we might have solved this merely with documentation. But I think this is the same class of problem. And so I don't have an answer for you, but I have this issue, which will hopefully lead you to an answer. Because as I say, I think it's a very similar. Um, and the, the surprising thing is that locally, the first request gets rejected super quickly. Yeah, yeah. And then on .com, it, it takes forever. Yeah, exactly. So it really feels that on locally, my, my request 
um, gets workhorse gets the header the the request headers call the authorize and see that this is not a valid upload and we'll just reject the client do but, you have nginx enabled for your local setup in gdk uh yeah i did okay in that case i would be inclined to blame it on gitlab.com's ha proxy or cloudflare mm. one or the other because it's definitely to do with request buffering essentially something somewhere along the chain is buffering the entire request before continuing on. And I think, I'm not certain, but I think we solved that in Workhorse um, and Nginx. So if it's working as you expect with Nginx in front of Workhorse, then the answer has to be either gitlab.com's HA proxy or our CDN network is buffering the request before it gets to us. And I think that's quite likely. Um, I think I would almost expect Cloudflare to do that. Yeah, okay. That was my guess from uh, <laughs> a newbie in Workhorse that we have something in front of Workhorse that is saying, hey, stop this first request. We are going to wait for the whole body before yeah. going forward. But uh, at least you're not the first person to have this problem. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's the same class of problem as this Kerberos authentication. So that should help. Great, thanks. I will read that issue. Nice. Uh, while I've been talking, there have been a couple of other things that have popped into my mind around this general design and structure of workhorse that I, I think I should say, but they're just kind of a grab bag of things. And the most important one is it's almost like the philosophy of workhorse, if you like. It's, it's very deep and profound. It's not really. Workhorse does not contain, uh, what's the right word? It's, workhorse only ever does things that Rails tells it to do. That's kind of the, the, the principle of Workhorse. It doesn't contain the logic. It isn't in charge. GitLab Rails is in charge. And to an extent, this gets blurred with the path-specific URLs where we're doing work before it gets back to us. But the general idea is that we should be responding to things that Rails tells us to do. Sometimes we just have to encode that for efficiency reasons in the code of Workhorse. And the other major thing I guess I'd say is that Workhorse doesn't really do background processing of any kind whatsoever. <laughs> uh, I mean, talking about this whole feature as we've been going through, I've been quite conscious of the fact that we've got a long running process we have to do, which is download the file from um, Docker Hub. We then get those bytes. We've already streamed them to the client if we're being efficient. We finished the response that we're giving to the client. And now we've got finalization work to do. We've got to finish the upload, finish the storing of this into the cache uh, if we're not to unnecessarily delay the client. So usually when we have background work to do, we want to do that in Sidekick. Um, and sometimes that's quite difficult to get to work at the same time as having Workhorse in the mix. I do think this absolutely belongs in Workhorse. This is just one of those thorny problems that I'm putting in the middle and saying, nobody touched this, it's quite hard. Uh, you know, we have to somehow handle background work and, and that's quite difficult to do. I think Stan linked us to a particular issue to do with object storage and the finalized call where essentially what we end up doing is uploading the file to a temporary location. And then the finalized call is to move it from the temporary object storage bucket to its final location. And that can take a long time if they're different buckets. Um, so I don't think that blocks this work, but the general idea of there being um, large pieces of work to do at the very end of the response, this is the problem for workhorse, and it's something that we need to take care of when we are designing the feature. Does that make sense? Or am I just talking nonsense? <laughs> it happens sometimes. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, I mean, if we can offload these things to the sidekick, it's always better to do so. The general rule that we have for workhorse is that features are best not done in workhorse unless there's really no other way to do it. And as we're seeing on gitlab.com, that we were hopeful that writing this and only having it turned on when it's Puma, that's the application server, would mean that we could just do this and we wouldn't have to implement it in workhorse. And we've discovered that that's not the case. And actually, we do need workhorse for this. Uh, and that's why we're where we are. I guess the last thing to say is 
backward compatibility really matters, um, especially because we've already got a working dependency proxy in production. We have to be absolutely sure that this code works when it's an old workhorse and a new GitLab Rails, or a new GitLab Rails and an old workhorse. Uh, both of those directions really matter, and we have to make sure that we have compatibility there, which could be an issue. Uh, if you just always think about it as in half the fleet is running old workhorse and new rails or vice versa, that generally throws up the problems. But we have frequent backward compatibility problems when we change something like this in workhorse. And again, it's just one of those thorny problems that needs careful design during implementation. And that's really all I've got. All right. Well. If there's no other questions from anyone, um, thank you so much for taking the time to get together with us and walk through some of this and discuss some of these ideas. We uh, nice. really appreciate it. That was good to chat. And if you have any questions or want any more involvement, then just you know, poke me in Slack or in an issue and I'll, I'll respond as fast as I can. I'll bring it up with Sean tomorrow as well. I've got a regular one-to-one -one with him and just see if I can get an idea as to what the plan is from source code side. Cool. Yeah, I'm guessing for us, the, the next steps will be start talking about some of that design and the issue. No worries, thanks a lot. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Sarah.